A familiar spot here on the A604 between Chapel and Wakes Cone, the blacksmiths, and with us is John, John Tatum. John, what are you working on here at the forge? I'm heating up a bar here to make a heavy scroll. You have to get a nice heat on there to get a heavy scroll. And then I shall form it around the anvil and display it out and uh, make it into a large scroll. Tell me about the history of this site. Has there been a blacksmith's here for many, many years? Well, I understand that that's been here since 1400 thereabouts and uh, been a smithy ever since. Father came here in 1934. As a Cornishman, he came up looking for work and found this property that was standing empty and took it on and he was a farrier at the time and carried on doing the work ever since. So, John, tell me about the history of this particular building. I mean, is it the original building going back to the 1400s? Yeah, the, the, the original building is the smaller part, which, is, which we're standing in at the moment. Um, over the years, we've uh, improved on it, but I mean, the actual structure is the original smithy inside, you know. Um, but we've had to adapt it to our more modern ways, as you could put it, you know, to accommodate so that we can carry on working. Because the smithy years ago basically worked on smaller equipment, didn't he? I mean, the horse-drawn stuff was all small, wasn't it? And he could get it in smaller places. But as the time went on, we had to open plan the place a bit more to accommodate more room so we can swing bigger stuff around, sort of thing. There's a reason why this particular part goes out towards the road, isn't it? Because horses used to come that's in right, here? That's right, that's right. I mean, uh, the horses used to come off the road straight into the travis where the, they were shod, and then the smithy forge part was a little higher up, which you stepped up to the forge and down into the level with the road, you see. The horses would have walked in level with the road. And I mean, uh, in those days, I mean, they used to queue up waiting to be shod. When I was a boy, I remember that well. And. Uh, I mean, you were 12 when you started welding, weren't you? That's right. Yeah, I mean, uh, as a boy, I was always very interested in looking at what my father was doing and always copying what he was doing, and I learnt the trade. I mean, I was welding before 12, sort of thing, but, I mean, competent at 12, making things, and, you know, and it's gone on from there, really. Now, Dad was a Cornishman. When did he come to this part of the world? Well, he, he was looking for work in the 30s, and he came up here in 1934. And uh, he worked his way up. There was no work down in Cornwall. So he worked his way up as a farrier, working his way up. And he saw this smithy that stood vacant. And he approached the, land, the local landlord and he took the tenancy on and carried on ever since. Married up here and raised a family here. Well, John, you were an accomplished welder then at age 12. And your dad was here in 1934. When did you actually become a blacksmith yourself? Well, when I left school. I mean, I naturally came in to work with my father. And I mean, uh, then I was on a three-year apprenticeship. And uh, after that, you were sort of classed as a blacksmith then. You'd done all the sweat and, uh, and done the hard work. So you got, you worked your way into the business sort of thing. Um, and then uh, I worked for my father up till 1970. And uh, I had itchy feet, wanted to go on my own. Uh, spread out more, had different views, of course. I mean, Dad being older generation, I had different ideas and I wanted this branch out. So I started on my own in 1970, in business on my own, uh, in the next village at Chapel, and built that business up um, for, for 20 years. And then my father retired and we sold that business and came back down to the original blacksmith shop which is here um, and here we are plugging away. It's going to be kept in the family though John isn't it because yes, your son, right. son yes, is right. taking over? That's right Roger, Roger's coming on learning the trade and hopefully you know continue on. Tell me about Spend a Penny Forge, what's that story? Well it was a, it was a farm cottage with a barn and at the time I saw that uh, as a chance that I could, and I, funnily enough, there was a story to, attached to that. I, I used to go past that backwards and forwards to work, and uh, I saw a gentleman working on the roof, and I went up and asked him whether he'd consider selling it. And uh, funnily enough, that evening before, him and his wife had discussed selling the 
property, which eventually we bought, and uh, the old barn we turned into a forge. We made it into, you know, equipped it out and got permission to do so, and then we carried on from there. Why spend a penny? Now, apparently that's an old original name, if it's true. I was told that when the coaches used to go by, a hundred years ago, they used to stop there to spend a penny. And that was named Spend a Penny. And that, that, that was said that that used to cost a penny. I presume they stopped and had a cup of tea as well or something, didn't they? And, and used the toilets or whatever. And, and uh, that, was, that was named after that, apparently. The old horse coaches. The changing role, though, of the blacksmith, gone are the days of the horses. What's the main work that you do nowadays, John? Well, we, as I say, we, we still do a lot of agricultural repairs, but nothing near the extent that we used to do. It's gone years, because everything is changing so rapidly these days with the new technology of, as you know, the farm equipment and that getting so large. I mean, all the farmers today are getting big acreage, big machines, so therefore you're looking at a totally different concept, really. You've got you, you, the, all these machines up well maintained and we don't get the breakages like we would on the smaller equipment but we're fortunate that we're I think that there's more interest in decorative arm work these days that we're able to pick up what we lose on the agriculture side on the wrought iron side as the saying is so I think we're fortunate we're still here really when you say still here I mean is it a trade that's disappearing from the highways and byways oh yeah I, th I think uh, we're lucky to be here still because I mean it, 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 can you name many forges that are still going? And Well, I, I call a blacksmith a man who works by his living from, from afar. OK, the fire is, is important here, yes, that's right. the, you know, the forge. Yep. What other kit have you got here? What other tools of the trade do you use? Well, I mean, of course, we use welders, modern electric welders, which assist us now. I mean, nowadays, you don't fire weld anymore. I mean, that's, that's a thing of the past, isn't it? I mean, electric welding, MIG welding, and then, of course, the equipment we use is power hammers, where they used to use sledgehammers years ago. You'd have had a striker, one man hitting with a sledge, and the other one shouting, hit, and tap. And, but now it's all mechanical devices, isn't it? And that's uh, made life a lot easier, isn't it? But your workshop is full of tools from times past. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We, we still use the, the old tools that we used 50 and 100 years ago. I mean, not. I still get amazed I go around to museums these days and have a look and they've got tools hanging up there that I'm still using. <laughs> How do you feel about the next century then? Do you think uh, there'll still be the importance of the blacksmith in the year 2000 and beyond? No, I don't think. I, I think honestly that the new generation that are coming now don't even know what a blacksmith is. I mean, the young people that come in my workshop today, they look at me as I'm on some sort of freak. I mean, they, they just don't understand what a blacksmith is, and why should they? I mean, they're brought up into the modern world with all mass production. I mean, they don't understand that a man has to sweat and make things by heating it up and bending it. I mean, it's all technology today. It's all done with computers, isn't it? I mean, that's, they look on me as a very strange man, I reckon, don't you? <laughs>
with... Uh... John, I must ask you, any special stories you'd like to share with us? Well, there was one that comes to mind of a, a horseman at a local farm here. He's, he took delivery of a new tractor. He was, he'd never driven a tractor before. I mean, that was when they first come about at Ferguson, Little Ferguson. And his boss said to him, he said, you've got to learn to drive this tractor. And he said, I don't know, I'm a bit worried about it. Anyway, he had to bring something up to be repaired. So the farmer said to him, well, I think you ought to try that tractor out and take it up the blacksmiths. Well, anyway, he turns up here with this little tractor and he's the other side of the road and we see him coming. We thought, hello, Arthur's on his tractor. And he stopped this tractor and he looked down and of course we went out to him, we realised he was in trouble. He said, I don't know how to stop it. He said, uh, I think I'll switch a key off. So he switched the key off and he said, um, well, I don't know that I shall ever be able to start it again. But anyway, we advised him and he had to pull off the road into the yard and he let the clutch and nearly shot off the seat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that, that was a lovely story about Arthur. Yeah. I mean, the horseman having to you learn to drive a tractor, you know. Yes, I remember, well, uh, one of the farm workers coming to me in rather a bit of a state because while he was ploughing with his modern tractor, um, he got his earphones on listening to the radio and the tractor gave a sudden surge, which he didn't bother to look round and see what was happening. And uh, when he did, the, the tractor came to a halt, couldn't pull it anymore. When he looked around, the plough tipped over on its side and buried itself and uh, created a huge mound. And he came to me in a hurry before his governor came home to, to, to bring my lorry with a crane on to lift it out before his governor could see what he'd done. Right. Well, I understand many years ago that uh, before all this modern medicine and techniques that the babies of the village that had nappy rash. They used to bring the babies along and put their bottoms in the trough when it was warm and the iron in the water would cure the nappy rash. That's what I understand that has happened in the many years ago. John, away into your side workshop, what, what have we got here? Well, we've got some what they call saddle bars that are in church windows to support the lead light window, the stained glass windows. And uh, the churches at the moment that have been restored, they take these bars out uh, when they are also repairing the lid lights uh, and they bring them along to us uh, to have brass tips put on because uh, I understand that uh, these, the iron rod that went into the masonry would rust and expand and split the masonry. So the architects now uh, require that they should have brass tips put on. Which church have these come from? I think that's Debden, Debden Church. I mean, we get them in every week. I mean, churches are being done, they're getting grants at the moment, and uh, they're being renovated, and they're coming all round, all the churches, in within about 50 mile radius. So this will protect the metalwork, will it? No, it's, it's protecting the masonry from expansion, from rust. Let's see what's happening. 